Meister Eckhart once said, if the only prayer we ever say is thank you, that that is sufficient. So let's just take a moment of quiet and in our hearts tell God something or many things for which you are thankful. So gracious God, we just ask you to help us not take all of these wonderful gifts for granted. That's very easy to do. So uh, we just are mindful of our giftedness. And, and don't we have so much to be grateful for? <laughs> My <laughs> goodness <laughs> sakes. So, right. Um, I'm uh, Sister, I'm going to be real official. I'm Sister Rosemary Coughlin. <coughs> and as some people call me Sister Rosie, and I won't tell you what the rest call me. <laughs> uh, I want to welcome you to this uh, occasion. Um, I know that our prayers are going to help me stand on my own two feet up here. And, and I said I had to have a podium, not only to hold my notes, but to hold me up. Okay. So, uh, you'd think after all this time that I, I might get used to presenting, but I, I, th I think that's probably a good sign that a little bit uneasy at the beginning. And then maybe I'll just get through that, okay. Um, I uh, went to the academy here, St. Joseph Academy. Well, I, I, I'll start, I guess I'll start a little bit. I'm gonna do this a little backwards. Um, I'll start with my family. Um, I was, uh, my mother and dad were Bertha and Bob Coughlin. Now, most people said Coughlin, C O U G H, Coughlin. Um, but my Irish, and I, I think he had not quite as much Irish blood as he hoped he did. But, but he was, uh, oh my goodness, he was so, he celebrated yesterday. Um, he, he would, um, have uh, has said, um, I, I want you now just to stand on your own two feet, be up there, and just know that God is with you. And God's going to be speaking. I said, okay, well then I'll just leave. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, um, my fam, I'm from a little town, and the best way I can uh, describe its location it's called Kentland, Indiana, and it's about 45 miles northwest of Purdue, <laughs> almost on the Illinois line. And um, uh, mom, Bertha, and dad, Bob, and then I had a six-year-older sister, Eileen, and my brother, Paul, was two years older. So, of course, that made me the, yeah. The baby. <laughs> so those of us who are youngest, don't you want to be called the baby <laughs> until you're as old as I am? <laughs> and that's fine. Um, and I went to um, a different community of sisters in elementary school. And um, uh, they were, um, I got a, an excellent education, just a great education. They, they almost, I think, were more cloist like cloistered because they never ate in front of us or drank water or, you know, they didn't. didn't. So I think in, back in those days, as they say, that was more common, you know. And um, then when I, um, well, my dad was educated by the Sisters of St. Joseph of St. Pat's in Kokomo. And we grew up thinking that they walked on water. Because oh my, he quoted Sister Catherine, and oh my goodness, he, we you know, and then my mom used to come here. They used to have uh, summer retreats, a retreat in August, and and mom came to those retreats for many many years. Of Father Farrell, and I think he was the retreat director probably for twenty summers because they loved him so much. And so um, I guess uh, I. I got a good education uh, in, in St. Joseph Grade School in Kentland, Indiana. And um, 
And then, uh, because of mom and dad's knowledge of the Sisters of St. Joseph, after I graduated from eighth grade, there were six of us that graduated from eighth grade <laughs> in our <laughs> school. So the high school seemed very large, you know, and, and I was very shy as younger. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so I don't know whether they talked about it, and, and then they said one time, would you ever think you'd like to go to St. Joseph Academy? And of course, Mom had talked about it. Um, and I said, well, I don't know. I, I'd like to see it. So she said, well, I, I know one of the ladies, and, and she rents out rooms. So we came, and, and I, you know, I thought, yeah, it's out in the country. This is beautiful. I loved it. So um, that's why I came to St. Joseph Academy. And uh, the very first night, because um, Anybody remember Sister Madonna? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that, yep. that, that's going to be a little age specific there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, she was the principal. She was a, a, her name was Wall. She was from Kokomo. And oh my goodness, what a lovely woman she was. And she was on hall duty that night. And um, I was in a room with four, there were four of us in a room. And she was in a rocker right outside our door. And um, uh, Barbara, who then became Sister Josita, some of you would remember Sister Josita. Yeah. Um, she had been there as an eighth grader. They even had eight uh, grade school boarders. And she had been there as an eighth grader because her parents were divorced when she was in the seventh grade. So they sent her there in the eighth grade. So she knew all the ropes. So she said to somebody, go down and get a plate and a fork for Sister Madonna. And I thought, well, now, isn't that lovely? She's going to give Sister Madonna a piece of watermelon to take back to the convent. That's fair. How thoughtful. So OK, she goes, oh, come on in, Sister Madonna. Now, why doesn't she give the watermelon to Sister Madonna to take out to the convent? So Sister Madonna came in sat on the bed. We were not supposed to sit on the beds. She's the principal. She goes in and she sits on the bed. So somebody handed her plate with the watermelon and a fork. And she picked up the fork and she said, well, what's this for? I put her down, picked up the watermelon. And I thought, gosh, none's going to be human. <laughs> So that kind of started my love affair with the Sisters of St. Joseph. And um, so then I, I was at the academy for three years, and then I entered the convent when I was a senior in high school. Isn't that a riot? 17 years old, <laughs> entered the convent. But in those days, that was pretty common. So not anymore. <laughs> okay, so that's, um, I'm going to just start with a, a history of the Sisters of St. Joseph. Uh, we were founded, the Sisters of St. Joseph were founded in France in 1650. And um, at that time, religious life was mo mostly the cloistered life. And um, which was wonderful because the sisters, like the, I think, poor Claire's, aren't they, in, in Kokomo, um, you know, th their lives are dedicated to, to praying and contemplating. And so it's kind of nice to know we have that spiritual backup. I I'm very grateful to those sisters. However, uh, Father, uh, a Jesuit priest, Father Jean-Pierre Maidai, uh, he wanted a group of women uh, and who, who would be dedicated and would minister among the people. And that was at a time of great upheaval. Uh, France had been torn apart by wars. And uh, just as we know, exists today in our world, how the, the very chaotic and devastating effects uh, brought about by war. And I thought, think, think Syria. You know, you just you can't even imagine. So it was that way in France. And six women who had been formed in the spirituality that was presented by Father Maidai, they answered that call. Uh, and he did not want them to stand out from the people. 
And so he said, just take your wardrobe with you. And, and that, that wardrobe was just the, the common dress of the day. And occasionally, there were some wore veils, I think especially the widows wore veils. And so uh, also, just being dressed in, in the, com the common dress, uh, that also was a, a, like a protection against being steered into the cloister form of life. So then that freed those sisters to minister to the needy and the poor among them. And we have a term we call those to, uh, with whom and to whom we minister, we call them the dear neighbor. As, as a very common expression, the dear neighbor. Uh, Father Maidai described the Sisters of St. Joseph mission and ministry in very broad terms. They were to, in quotes, to practice all the spiritual and corporal works of mercy of which a woman is capable, which of course is all 14 of them. <laughs> <laughs> And in, in, in case anybody asks me, what are the seven spiritual works of mercy and what are the seven corporal works of mercy, you could probably all help me. We could kind of do you good to it. But just in case, I, I, I go to coffee. Uh, um, only one of those six women who was a widow could read and write. She signed her name and then listed the other five names on what was called the Document of Association, the very beginning of the Sisters of St. Joseph. Now, all six of them were very simple, hardworking women. They were lace makers and um, had the privilege to go to uh, Le Puy uh, back in 01, two, years, two, two weeks after 9-11, uh, but somebody said, oh, that could have been scary. I said, no, I think the skies were probably safer then <laughs> than, than otherwise. Um, and uh, so we got to see uh, the lace makers. And I'm going to pass this on. Sister Wanda, who is in ministry in, at Beach Grove in Indianapolis these days, couldn't be here, or she would have told you. She just was, went to Le Puy not too long ago. It's capital L-E, capital P-U-Y, Le Puy. And uh, she brought me back this piece of lace so you could just pass that around and get a sense of some of the things. And they used shuttles, wooden shuttles. And, and when we would walk up to the cathedral, we could see them they had like maybe 20 here with, with the, the thread and then about 20 over here. And then they would go, I couldn't even begin to watch them and how they made the lace. And also, and I think I'll just do this now. Um, also, this, sometimes I tell people this is our habit. <laughs> this is our, our form of identification. Um, and if you'll notice, the inside is very much like lace. And look closely to the middle, there are four hearts and our founder, Father Maidai, called us the Congregation of the Great Love of God. Mm -hmm. so. And our sisters and our associates uh, wear, wear their cross. You got yours on, Betty? No, oh, she has a hard on. I, and she said that, shoot, I should have wore it. Well, <laughs> so I said, look, let's see what she had. She had a star. Well, that, that was a star. Um, so those sisters then really became part of a new form of religious <coughs> life. And we call that form the apostolic form of religious life. And really, I believe that, that the apostolic form of religious life has profoundly affected both church and society. I think we've, we've had a great effect. Now, during the next 140 years, uh, there were more than 200 communities of the Sisters of St. Joseph spread all over to the south, south central, and eastern part of France. But then I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Uh, nearly 50 years 
after being founded in 1650, so that would take us to the end, to the French Revolution was occurring in the late 1700s. Uh, and of course there were dramatic and far-reaching changes. Convents were suppressed and congregations were disbanded. That was called the Reign of Terror. And uh, religious superiors encouraged the sisters to go back to their families for a while for safety. And um, during that reign of terror, the goods of the sisters were confiscated and five of our sisters of St. Joseph were guillotined. And um, many of course were in prison too. Um, our mother, St. John Fontvon, according to tradition, she was to be guillotined on July 28, 1794, but she was saved by the end of the Reign of Terror the very day before. She was to have said, well, evidently, I was not worthy of martyrdom. <laughs> and I was very blessed to have visited Le Puy. And where the guillotine stood now, there's a lovely tree and a monument dedicated to the Sisters of St. Joseph. And, uh, and, and it's near a shopping center, and that's called Martyrdom Square. So I just, it's just a, yeah, and I, you know, the stand there on that spot. Yeah. <laughs> a great time of reflection, yeah. In the early 1800s, Mother St. John Fontbonne reestablished, or we say refounded, the Sisters of St. Joseph. Her father owned property in Lyon, France. And then that became the place of the refounding. And I was very privileged to visit both uh, the convents in Lyon and Le Puy. And again, as I said, just, just shortly after 9-11. A uh, friend and I stayed in the Lyon convent because the convent at Le Puy uh, was being uh, renovated. And we knew that ahead of time. So we stayed um, in Lyon, which was just about a two hour train ride south to go to Le Puy. And, um, well, yeah, I think I'll tell you this story. Um, <laughs> um, because the mother house being closed, um, uh, we found our way up, the taxi actually took us up to, to the convent and it was, a wa it was walled, but there was a door and a doorbell and I said to Gloria, you know, I'm going to go ahead and ring the doorbell. So I did, and she, we, oui? and I said yes. See, and I said, I am a sister of Saint Joseph from America. <laughs> <laughs> May we visit? And she said, Oh, regret, regret, no, no, no visit, no visit. I said, oh, Okay, well, thank you. So. I said, let's just walk around. We can at least say we walked around our first convent, you know, we can. So we walked down and then, and then the sidewalk turned and right there was a garage and, and it looked like that would have been the convent garage. And there was a lady in there and I said, sister? And she said, we? Oui. And, and I said, um, gave my little spiel, you know. Well, she could speak English. <laughs> Anyway, um, so, so I, I just said about this, she said, no, we're doing renovation. We just, she said, come back in about two years. What we knew, <laughs> yeah, sure. So what we really wanted to do was to visit, our, because the original kitchen from 1650 is still intact. And we wanted to see that. And that's because of the construction, we couldn't get through. So I'll pass this around. This is a picture of the original kitchen that two of our sisters there have visited. So, uh, so when, when she said that, uh, I don't know what made me say this. It had to be the Holy Spirit. And I said, toilet? <laughs> and she said, wee oui, wee. Oui. <laughs> So we got to go in, and uh, there were about four or five sisters there, 
Gloria had her uh, little video camera, you know, and so, and I said, photo? Oh, yeah, so they took off their aprons and put their sleeves <laughs> down, and we took pictures, and somebody said, did you remember to go to the toilet? <laughs> well, I went in, I know that. I went in and shut the door in. <laughs> Anyway, that, that, was, just, that was wonderful. Okay, and I see I'll live and then I forget where I am. <laughs> oh, um, and then a after we visited, we went on up the cathedral, which is right, right on the same way, uh, up many, 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 many steps. Uh, but what was wonderful about going to visit the cathedral was that there were women out making lace so we could stand there and watch exactly how they did that and then kind of envisioned, you know, our early sisters doing the same thing. Um, the first Sisters of St. Joseph uh, came to the United States in 1836, which uh, was not long after the refounding in Lyon. And it was at the request of the Bishop of St. Louis. He wanted sisters to come and teach the deaf in St. Louis. And there's, there's a part of St. Louis, a section I think it's called Crondelet, and that is the name of, uh, we call it our, our founding community or our, our cradle, the Sisters of St. Joseph Cradle. So whenever we have an event, which we have about every four or five years, a, a national event of the, all the Sisters of St. Joseph, it's always in St. Louis because of Crondelet. Um, so um, the uh, oh, yes, when those sisters arrived uh, from France, um, they, uh, I guess the bishop must have asked the Daughters of Charity uh, to provide housing. So, and that's always been a connection. We've always had that kind of a connection with the Daughters of Charity. Like when they were there at St. Vincent's, we always had a good, good connection with them. Um, the life uh, of our early sisters in America probably was one of hardship and yet deep piety. Um, and then St. John's in Tipton, and I don't, I couldn't tell you, maybe somebody from St. John's could tell us the name of the pastor way back in 1888. I'll give you a little <laughs> challenge here. Uh, but that, that somehow that pastor knew that there were sisters in St. Louis and asked if they could come and teach, uh, and, and that's when St. John's uh, started, was in 1888, for your history book. And um, uh, then uh, in, oh well, this is kind of goes back again, but in, since, since 1836, uh, the Sisters of St. Joseph has spread across the United States. Now it's underneath your chairs, some have already passed them out. You'll see pieces of paper. If you would pass those out and turn them to the heart side. The yellow that is Lapui, 1650, and then as you see what I did, um, I just took a red pen and circled the Sisters of Saint Joseph in the United States. Mm -hmm. Just want to study that, and then I put a, a red around the Carondelet. You just might take a study of that. Mm -hmm. We'll come back and talk again about what's in the green circle and all that happens. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, now if you want to just put those aside, or if you don't want to put them aside. <laughs> um, after the Vatican Council, which was like um, 1962 to 65, I believe, religious orders were strongly encouraged to connect back to their roots. So seven sisters of St. Joseph who could speak French formed a team and went back to Le Puy, France. And there, there was an, an old Jesuit, and he was in his 80s, Father Marius Naper. And his whole religious life as a priest, he had been a, a spiritual director to the Sisters of St. Joseph. And so he really could, could shed a lot of light uh, and, and taught us things like what we call sharing the state of the heart. That's something that we learned from, from that experience. And um, he also wrote a portrait of a daughter of St. Joseph. And if you turn your hearts over. And the only reason I hesitate to read this is because it's a legacy, and I guess I'm expected to live up to this legacy. But I don't know. <laughs> All right, this is a portrait of a daughter of St. Joseph. This is how she's known, a daughter of St. Joseph, this is what we see. This woman, this daughter, is a portrait. And this, uh, we see this daughter. Eyes open on a world both miserable and sinful, but a world worked on <coughs> by the Holy Spirit. Ears attentive to the sufferings of the world. Spirit alert to understand to divine what God and the dear neighbor await from her. Sleeves rolled up for ministry. Continual joy of spirit. This is the quiet inner glow of the sister whose life in the service of Jesus Christ has been successful. Father Marius Nemke. And a legacy? <laughs> Uh, as I said, Father Napier uh, had been the spiritual director for uh, the Sisters of St. Joseph uh, most of his priestly life. And um, as mentioned earlier, uh, when we learned the history of our founder, uh, Jesuit Father Maidai, that he did not want the sisters to stand out from the people they served. Thus, they wore the dress of the common people. Uh, this is why after Vatican II, we gradually changed back into the dress of the laity so as not to stand out from those we serve. And I think that's been helpful because a lot of people said, why? Why did, you know, we could identify you. Why, why did you not keep the habit? Someone maybe a little irrespectfully said, did you kick the habit? <laughs> then, but what happened in France really was that the styles of the lay women changed. So they, you know, they took off their veils and they shortened their skirts. And but then, why the the habit continued? The sisters did not change, and that's how we began to stand out. And that was never meant to be. So it, it kind of helped me to understand why. Okay, let's see. Uh, before the Vatican Council, most of the ministries in the Catholic Church were performed by priests and sisters. However, after Pope John the Twenty Third opened the windows uh, of the church by way of the Council, the laity including young women who wished to be involved in service to the church, had and still had many options from which to choose without entering the convent. And that's, you know, there's a diminishment in the, in the number of women who are entering the convent. Somebody said, I wonder how many uh, parents in our parish even asked their daughters if they would be interested in becoming a sister. Kind of interesting question, and yeah, I don't know. Um, while uh, some wish that the number of sisters could greatly increase and return to the parishes, the hospitals, and other places, 
I have a sense of the Vatican Council as the Holy Spirit giving you laity the invitation, I should say we laity, uh, the invitation to become much more involved in the ministries of the church, such as the roles in the parishes, health care, education, and so on, that you carry on the mission, vision, and values of the sisters. I'm going to ask a personal question. How many of you have any, um, any connection with your parish? <laughs> see? Yeah. So, see, it worked. <laughs> I, I can remember my dad after the Vatican Council, I can remember him saying, both mom and dad, and, and dad was, they were in their 80s, and, and dad said, we just figured that 2,500 bishops couldn't be wrong. So <laughs> we're, go, we're gonna take, we're gonna take this, what they're telling us, and we're gonna, we're gonna go with it. And so when he, on his 80th birthday on Pentecost Sunday, he, did, he was a lector. After uh, the Vatican Council, a good number of sisters left the convent and gradually there has been a diminishment in the number of Catholic sisters in our country. Um, shortly after, oh, I don't know, maybe after several of the sisters had left, we, ha we had a gathering. We invited the sisters to come back here to the mother house. And uh, it really was wonderful. We sat in this very room and, and it was just, we had a big circle and everybody would just kind of brought us up to date about where, what they were doing with their lives. And you know, every single one of them, either in their jobs or careers or volunteering, they were all doing some kind of service. So see, it works. Um, we Sisters of St. Joseph and other communities of sisters prayerfully discern how best to serve our church and our world. At the turn of the century, my Tipton community knew we needed to make a choice between yeah, I've got to find my page. Uh, 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 page five, where are you? <coughs> now that's terrible to be that dependent. But I am. That's called humility. <laughs> oh, it's right where it's supposed to be. Um, so um, we could either remain autonomous and eventually die, uh, and you know, people die, groups die. So we said, well, we, we could that be okay, kind of. Um, so we invited Jude Majors. I don't know if any of you remember who Jude is. Well, um, she was. Uh, taught by our sisters in Elwood, and, uh, and then she became an RN, and she was the first manager of St. Vincent's Hospice. And um, so we asked her if she would please come and get us kind of to deal with the fact that we could die. So um, the title of her presentation was The Dying of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Tipton. <laughs> it was, it, and I'm telling you, that day was probably, there, there was the deepest sharing that we ever did with each other, it, you know, because we just faced the fact that that's exactly what could happen. So then we studied ways um, uh, how we could stay autonomous and eventually die out. And then we studied ways of choosing relationships. So um, we decided that we would choose relationships. We decided we would choose life. And um, we reached out to the Midwest communities at, uh, on that uh, map, the one that's uh, surrounded, you might be able to kind of look at that now. The one in the green. <laughs> Those were all uh, individual mother houses. The leaders of those mother houses had been meeting for years 
And so it was just a very natural thing that because, you know, the sisters were diminishing in all the communities. So it took about, I think, about three to five years that they studied how could we become one. So as you see, in 2007, these communities, as you see, became one. And I can remember that we call it chapter when, when we had our first election of new officers, new uh, leadership. Um, we had we had name tags, and of course mine said, you know, Sister Rosie Coughlin Tipton. But we were also all given another name tag that was put behind that. So there was a time we had a prayer and a hymn. And we picked up the one, like mine said, Sisters, Sister Rosie Coughlin, Sisters of St. Joseph, Tipton, Indiana. Picked that one up, laid it aside, and now it said, Sister Rosie Coughlin, the Congregation of the Sisters of St. Joseph. Mm -hmm. So that's the way we said goodbye mm -hmm. to Tipton. Yeah. It was beautiful, really. Mm -hmm. Um, as you said again in, on the on the chart, um, um, the mother house closed almost six years ago. I, I looked that up. It was on March 27, 2013, <coughs> and then three years ago, the diocese purchased it, and that's what we have today. And I asked uh, Samir if at the end he would turn on the lights in the chapel. So if those of you who have not seen the chapel since way back, uh, you'd be welcome to go down and, and see the chapel. Uh, and we were, we were very grateful because I, I'm sure if the diocese hadn't purchased because it was closed for three years, and you know what that does to a building, so I'm sure it would be down by now, you know, if they hadn't. So we're very grateful to the diocese. And, and I think it's, it's really picking up, you know, in the groups that are coming in. So that, that's a plug. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, we have uh, what are called uh, associates. And um, I see some of our associates are here. And we have a, a formation program in which anyone who is interested in becoming an associate takes about, it's about a year of formation. And um, uh, Monica, if you don't mind, I'm gonna point you out. Uh, Monica is, Monica, well, it's just, Hello. Yeah. <laughs> she's in the process of becoming an associate. And we have met, a small group of us have met with her every month for several months. And, and we have a special book, we learn and we review and, and learn the history. And, and Monica's been just, I think, very dedicated to learning. So uh, may I ask uh, how many associates we have here? Would you raise your hand? Thank you. And uh, I don't know, is there anything you want to say about being an associate? Anybody? I loved it. OK. You still do. I love being here all those years. That's right. Betty, Betty was the coordinator of the center of the groups that came here for 25 years. Oh. Bill used to call me Nanny. Nanny. <laughs> <laughs> I can see you going. Um, now, um, on May 19th, you may want to put this in your uh, calendar, um, we were, we're going to have Mass at 1 p.m. here. Father Hosey will have the Mass. Monica will be received as a new associate. But you're all welcome to attend May 19th, Mass at 1 o'clock here in the chapel. And um, the associates and the sisters, we get together several times during the year. and. Um, Sometimes when Father Hosey is an associate, and uh, when when he can be here, he'll have mass 
and then we'll have a pitch in meal, you know, and visit. And it's just it's wonderful. And because we know that it's really the associates, after a few of us younger ones are <laughs> off the scene, um, <laughs> we know the associates are going to carry on the mission and vision and values of the Sisters of St. Joseph, and we're grateful for that. Let's see. Oh, I, this is just a note. I think I thought of this at the last minute. The Catholic Church is basically divided into laity and clergy. And you know, I'm not clergy, so I am <laughs> laity. laity. And I'm proud of it. I'm very pleased to talk of the laity. I was trying to think if there's anything about my family that I tell you, even I told you.